Okay. Hello and welcome to episode 92 of Question and Answer. I am, as usual, your host, Panyol Basa. And we would have just sort of a moderate amount of questions to answer, which probably will mean that it'll be well under three hours this time. Ah, uh, maybe it's just because the weather's nice and everything, and people are thinking about birds and butterflies instead of about Buddhism. You know, I'll start with B anyway. And before I start answering questions, I would like to give a shout out to Jeffrey, who uh, made a probably, I think it's pretty sure it's the single largest donation that has been made to me <laughs> since I stopped being a monk. So I shout out to Jeffrey saying, uh, congratulations on being a generous person. And uh, he's one of my viewers on BitChute. And I'm pretty sure that he started watching me because of me being on Brian Rue's show at the beginning. Like back when I was a monk and Brian Rue and I were doing like three three shows per week or something. That's uh, a lot of the, a lot of my viewers first saw me on on the brian rue show and i think jeffrey is one of them also he doesn't do paypal or anything like that so he, he actually sent me a check in the mail but uh now that i have done my due diligence and shouted out jeffrey's generosity i'm going to start answering questions and the first question is from bodhisattva 969 alias mara made mahayana and he says, do you prefer Schopenhauer or Nietzsche or none of them? Well, I really do not have much use for Nietzsche. I've never really liked Nietzsche very much. And I mean, I've read very little. I've, I've read The Antichrist. And I have to admit that H.L. Mencken's introduction to Nietzsche's The Antichrist was much more interesting to me. And I got more out of it than out of Nietzsche's work itself. In fact, I remember almost nothing from the Antichrist. Also, I read uh, part of Thus Spake Zarathustra, and I got up to the part where the tightrope walker falls off the tightrope and breaks his leg. Maybe got a little bit past that, but again, I think it's partly Nietzsche's writing style. It just doesn't really fit with my way of absorbing information very well. And so, definitely, I would prefer Schopenhauer. I've read The World as Will and Representation and a few of his other essays. And, yeah, I think uh, I, I like Schopenhauer better than Nietzsche, definitely. And Schopenhauer kind of was a, an early like promoter of Buddhism in the West. Like his, What he teaches comes very close to Buddhism in a lot of ways. Whereas Nietzsche kind of rebelled against the whole, I don't know, the slave morality kind of a thing that he would probably attribute to Buddhism as well as Christianity. But um, again, I'm no authority on Nietzsche, so I could be wrong on that one. But definitely, between the two, I prefer Schopenhauer to Nietzsche. Even though Schopenhauer, even though he was a brilliant man, I mean, he was kind of an, <clears throat> he was, he, he could not live up to his own philosophy. I mean, he had a lot of faults, and I used to worry about maybe becoming a kind of Schopenhauer myself, where you have this profound philosophy, but like in real life, you're just kind of a jerk. Anyways, I'm going to move on to Bodhisattva 969 second question, which is, <clears throat> is it true that the Kosala kingdom, which the Buddha often visited, is present day Myanmar? And no, that is not true. Kosala was a kingdom in like east northeast India in the Ganges Valley. And the Buddha's own um, native country of Kapilawatu, like the city-state of Kapilawatu, was a kind of vassal state under the political sphere of influence of Kosala. I'm pretty sure in at least one sutta, the Buddha calls himself a Kosalan, that he was from Kosala. And uh, present, I mean, what is now Burma in the Buddhist time was probably mostly jungle with some hunter-gatherers. I mean, southern Burma may have already had like uh, the Mon civilization going 
in southern Burma. But uh, <clears throat> that wouldn't be Kosala. Um, like in the Ashoka edicts, he, he mentions sending um, Buddhist missionaries to the east to, to Suwana Bumi, you know, the golden land. And that may have been a kind of Hmong kingdom which incorporated parts of southern Burma and western Thailand. I mean, going by modern day geography. But in the Buddhist time, um, yeah, in northern India, Burma was just unknown. What is now Burma? I'm pretty sure it was just unknown territory, more, largely because it was just mostly wilderness. So I guess I'll just move on to uh, Bodhisattva 969's. No, I guess he doesn't have a next question. He has two questions, but also I have written here. Somebody asked me a question a few weeks ago that <clears throat> somehow disappeared, that either they retracted the question or something. And uh, it's a question about monks, especially like the senior monk, like the abbot of a monastery, living in a kingly manner, you know, feasting on lots of good food and, and sleeping on, you know, this elaborate bed in his own elaborate bedroom when like the rank and file of monks, especially the novices, are just kind of living a plain existence, more of what you would expect from monks. And um, maybe the question got retracted. Maybe not. I don't know. But uh, if anyone asks that question and you really want it answered, you can ask it again. And I'm just going to move on to the next question here. This is from Mooners. <clears throat> and Mooners says, What do you think of the validity of other Buddhas in other realms and veneration of them? Buddha and Bodhisattvas that are not included in the list of 28 in the Buddha Wamsa. I have heard that the Sinhalese pray to Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara in the form of Nata Deva. Well, I mean, I, the validity of other Buddhas in other realms and veneration of them, I think it's mythology. I think it was made up. In fact, the, the 28 Buddhas that are found in the Pali text, the Buddha Wamsa, I mean, aside from our own Gautama Buddha, I think those were probably made up also. I mean, it may be that Kasapa Buddha, who was he's supposed to be, by Buddhist tradition, the Buddha that was the Sama Sam Buddha who started Buddhism bef just, just previous to our Gautama Buddha. Maybe there is some historical authenticity of just, you know, in the distant past, there was some Buddha that, you know, he, he survived in traditional folklore or something. But, you know, the future Buddha, Mateya, and the, the line of 28 Buddhas, of which Gautama Buddha is 27th, going all the way back to Dipankara Buddha on some other, some other earth. That, uh, yeah, that's, it's in a way, it's, it started with the glorification of Gautama Buddha, glorification of the founder of the tradition, which then got turned into Buddhas are just astronomically more advanced or beyond an ordinary enlightened being or an arahant, which I think is itself an innovation that came up, you know, after the time of the Buddha. And then it started, um, that led to like Jataka stories of, of like <clears throat> the Buddha's noble, strenuous efforts, lifetime after lifetime for countless eons to perfect his parami so that he could become a Samasam Buddha, not just an ordinary enlightened being. And then you have like the whole cult of the Buddhas. And then you have this, this lineage of Buddhas and they're all named. And there's, I mean, if you want something, just you want to read something totally bizarre, read the, the supposed life of Mangala Buddha, who was like two incalculable eons ago on, on a different earth in, in a different India. And I mean, you just read the details and you can see that it's, it's, pretty much unbelievable to any Westerner other than a Westerner who's just very faith oriented and will believe whatever his religion tells him to believe. So, I mean, even with regard to the ones that are in Orthodox Theravada, I still think that it's mostly just made up mythology. And when you get into 
other Buddhas like Mahayana Buddhas and Mahayana Bodhisattvas and so forth, then that's like another step beyond even that. Or you can just put it all in the same category of like mythological apocrypha or something. But I don't take any of that seriously. I mean, even, you know, the future Buddha Mateya, the, the previous Buddha Kasapa, um, you know, even that I'm pretty skeptical of. So with regard to that, yeah, I, I do not think that it's really, there's no empirical validity. You know, it, it's the, the validity is entirely based on faith. And there are some people, you know, sort of like the early Christians or even modern Christians who think that faith is really all, all that's really necessary. You've got faith in it. That's good enough. And whether, I mean, just having faith in it is somehow an indication that it's true. And, uh, yeah, I just, I just don't swing that way. I just do not operate that way. I like to have some empirical evidence supporting what I believe, if at all possible. So, and then at the end here, he just says, uh, that I have heard that the Sinhalese pray to Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara in the form of Nata Deva. I don't really know much about that. I do know that in Bur in Burma, there is a Nat or a Deva called Lokanata. And like his images, he's always got his feet pressed together, soul to soul. He's sitting with his feet pressed together that way. That's one way you can know that it's Lokanata. And um, yeah, I never heard anything about him being identified with the Bodhisattva Aval Avalokiteshvara. Lokanata just means Lord of the world. He's sort of like the Santnat or the protecting Deva of the, the planet Earth. <clears throat> and uh, I guess maybe he's been doing a good job of, you know, warding off meteor impacts or something. But with regard to the Sinhalese praying to the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, who in China is known as Guan Yin, like in Mahayana, he's pretty, he pretty much had a kind of transition into a, being a female called Guan Yin. But um, yeah, I, I really don't, I really don't have much interest in, in like the mythological aspects of later Buddhism. The mythological aspects of early Buddhism, I have some interest in mainly for anthropological reasons, just to get a better feel for the culture in which the Buddha lived and for, in which Buddhism arose. So I'm just gonna move on to Mooners' next question here. Which is, what do you think of the idea of translating the Tapitaka into classical languages such as Greek and Latin, as those are integral to Western identity? Think of it as a form of syncretism, which is kind of a strange idea, although it does remind me of a, a story by J.D. Salinger. I think it was Franny and Zooey, in which one of the characters, <clears throat> I think it was Zooey, um, I mean, he's obviously considered to be a bodhisattva. He's, I mean, in, it's the whole story is kind of an allegory. And uh, anyways, when he was like in college or something, he broke up with his girlfriend or some such, and he sort of overcame the heartache by just dedicating himself to writing uh, a translation of one of the Upanishads into Attic Greek. And I mean, it's possible, I mean, I, I assume it's already been done. I assume that at least, um, you know, some Eastern texts have been translated into Latin I, at the very least. But uh, nobody reads classical Greek and Latin anymore other than like specialist scholars. You know, it's like it used to be not very long ago in Western civilization that even in high school, you'd learn some Latin at least. And if you went to college, you pretty much had to be proficient in in Latin and classical Greek. And nowadays, it's I mean, even even just English is considered to be. I mean, you don't even have to be proficient in that anymore. That good English is now considered to be racist or some such, which is just further evidence of the decline of Western civilization. But um. 
I mean, it can be done. You can translate the Tipitaka into Latin or classical Greek if you want to, but I'm really not sure what the point of it would be other than just as a kind of social gesture because, or as a kind of sort of like with the, the, the guy in the Salinger story, just as a kind of personal exercise in, in self-discipline or something. I mean, you could translate the entire Tipitaka into classical Greek and then not even have it published just, just because of the effect it has on you personally. You know, it definitely help you to understand the texts. Because <sighs> if you want to translate correctly or accurately, then, I mean, you really have to try to understand each word in the, each text as well as you can in order to get it right. Or get it as close to right as it is possible to get it. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the point of it would be because, as I say, almost nobody reads Greek or Latin anymore. But who knows? It depends on your own personal volition that would determine whether it's a good idea or not, I think. So I'm just going to move on to the next question here. This is from GameFap. And GameFap says, what's your thoughts on the apparent recent trend of people setting themselves on fire in the U.S.? On your website, you have the famous photo of that Buddhist who lit himself up in the 60s. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of a, like a, a fashion trend it is. I'm not sure how much of a fad it is now. And I'm going to check and make sure that we're recording. And yes, it says we're recording. So I've heard of like one guy who was protesting the, the war in Israel, I think, by setting himself on fire. I don't know if he survived or, or what happened to him. Um, but, I mean, it's not exactly a trend. You know, there's a few people that have done it who have immolated themselves. Um, but in Asia, it's more of, it's more of a trend. Like uh, the famous Vietnamese monk who let himself on fire um, in protest of the Vietnamese government. I think this was even before the, the Vietnam War. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, he and a friend had both agreed that they were going to light themselves on fire. And I think the friend had already done it. It's just that that was the, the famous iconic one. But apparently it was kind of a thing, you know, sort of a weird tradition. <clears throat> and um, I've read also that just a few years ago, it's like two or three years ago, that more than 100 Tibetan monks had immolated themselves in that year. So it's, for some reason, they do it. Although it's, um, for a monk, a Theravada Buddhist monk, it would be against the rules. Committing suicide is a dukkha offense, which you can't confess because you're dead after you've done it. But um, what else can I say about this? What are my thoughts on the apparent recent trend of people setting themselves on fire in the U.S.? Well, I mean, I, I do think that people should have the right to, to kill themselves if they want to, although there's better ways of doing it than others. Maybe setting yourself on fire would, uh, would be a way of doing it. I used to sort of semi-jokingly consider doing that when I was staying in Bellingham. Just go to the, the local Dharma hall, set myself on fire on the front porch as a kind of protest. But I never did. It was it was just kind of a joke. Sometimes I tell people, you see me walking towards the dorm hall with a can of gas. Uh, you'll know what's going on. So let's see here. Yeah, I mean, it's not really much of a trend. As far as I can tell. Unless it's a lot of it's just not being publicized. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Cleefy. And Cleefy said, Could you expand on a statement you mentioned in your Q&A's Regret for one action generates a negative karma. How so? Yeah, well, regret or remorse or like a guilty conscience is called kukucha in Pali. And that also includes any kind of worry about the future. Just worry, anxiety, regret, remorse. That whole spectrum is, is considered to be, is called kukucha and is considered to be bad karma. It's an unwholesome mental state. So, like, for example, if you regret having done something, it's like you're setting yourself up against reality. You know, it's like you're unhappy because of the way things are. 
you can't change the past, but still it's like you have this desire for the past to be different. And that's just, that's just stupid. That's just idiotic. You can't change the past unless you know, in some metaphysical way, there are an infinite number of pasts and you can sort of alter the past somehow by just firmly believing a different version of the past or some such. But even then it wouldn't require remorse or regret, which is an unhappy feeling because you want the past not to have been that way. And setting yourself up against the way things are or the way things were that can't be changed is just, it's insane, essentially. And also, I could even go farther and to say that unhappiness in general, technically speaking, is immoral in Buddhism. Whenever you're unhappy, you are acting in an, in an immoral or unethical or at least an unwholesome manner because all suffering is ultimately self-inflicted. And so you are inflicting this unhappiness upon yourself by desiring things to be different. And desiring the past to be different is dumber than desiring certain other things to be different because there's no way you can change it. And I mean, even with the present, you can't change the present. I mean, you can change the future by setting about changing things so that, you know, the future is, is going to be different. But the present moment is what it is. You can't change that either. So if it's raining outside and you're unhappy because it's raining, it's just dumb unhappiness. You're setting yourself up against reality. All the desire and misery in the world isn't going to make it stop raining. So you're just in a state of conflict with samsara and any kind of like mental conflict is, is going to be unskillful to some degree. Like, uh, J. Krishnamurti used to call it friction. You know, it, it saps so much of your life force, just being in a state of friction against the way things are. So I hope I answered that question. You know, it's, it's essentially wanting things to be different and wanting things to be different in a really insane kind of a way because you can't change the past. So I'm going to move on to Cleefy's next question. And Cleefy says, the second question is, why 84,000 is a significant number in Buddhism? And I think 84,000 was a significant number in ancient India in general. I mean, it's, it's just kind of like the stereotypical big number, you know, like a zillion gajillion or six gorillion or, or whatever. So... I mean, 84,000, there's, I really can't even think of a doctrinal, like anything in like Orthodox Theravadan doctrine that uses the term 84,000, other than maybe the 84,000 families of worms or something. Um, <clears throat> but it does mention in the texts, when it's talking about the Ajivakas, who are fatalists, they were strict determinists, who believed, I'm pretty sure that you that each being would have to live 84,000 lives. And it was just predetermined, you know, you start off at the bottom and your 84,000th life, you become an enlightened Ajivaka. So, I mean, apparently I would guess that 84,000 was just sort of a stereotypical, very big number in ancient India. Maybe it was considered, um, you know, almost sacred, just for mathematical reasons or numerological reasons, but I'm not sure exactly what it would be, but it wasn't specific to Buddhism. I'm pretty sure it was just like the Iron Age Ganges Valley had some, they had some regard for the number 84,000. Maybe it goes back to the Indus Valley civilization or something, but I really don't know. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Kyle and Kyle put this under an, a video, an old video I did with uh, a guy named Numa when we were discussing Neoplatonism and just uh, like pre-Christian Western spirituality in general. And so Kyle, <clears throat> under that video, um, he left this comment. He said, theories I have. Number one, Augustine screwed up by not making the trinity of ethos, pathos, and logos the father, mother, and child. Two, 
Christianity is indeed Platonism for the masses, but the insistence on literal interpretation of Bible eventually spelled doom. Three, balance in the West began tipping with Aquinas, Occam, and the scholastics nominalists in the Middle Ages shift from Plato to Aristotle. This also spelled doom. And then four, the Marvel Universe is basically a rebirth of pagan religion. Pagans did not believe in a literal Zeus anymore than you and I believe in a literal Superman. It's a story with deeper meaning. Any thoughts? Well, okay, so go up to his number one. Augustine screwed up by not making the Trinity um, father, mother, and child. So, um, yeah, that might have been more in accordance with Neoplatonism, where you've got, or or even like in Hinduism, where you've got sort of the father or like Brahma, who is sort of like the, the ground of being. And then you have more of a feminine creator spirit, like the demiurge that just sort of, or in, in Hinduism, that Brahma's consort is Maya, I'm pretty sure, which is just sort of like illusion or the world of some, the world of diversification that is sort of like a, a feminine, you know, giving birth of the 10,000 things, so to speak. If you don't mind me, like mixing together a number of spiritual traditions in my language here. So, and then child, I guess that would be Jesus, but um, yeah, I mean, I really don't have much to say on that. I mean, it would seem to make more sense, but not making sense is it's kind of a Christian specialty sometimes. Like the whole Trinity is, you know, I've read that like in Greek Orthodox Christianity, especially they really emphasize the nonsensicalness of the Trinity as a way of emphasizing just the incomprehensibility of, of the divine. You know, it's, it's a way of humbling you by giving you this doctrine that you can't really understand. And, and so it's like, you know, God understands it anyway. That makes him greater than us. So number two, <clears throat> Kyle's number two idea is Christianity is indeed Platonism for the masses. But the insistence on literal interpretation of the Bible eventually spelled doom. Yeah, well, that was, um, I think the Protestants especially, they wanted to drag like literalism into, into uh, an understanding of the Bible more than the, the Catholics did. But still, I'm, I'm really not an authority on Christianity and how it relates to Platonism. So... Um, I mean, I'm kind of skeptical of the idea that Christianity is indeed Platonism for the masses, considering that Christianity emphasizes so much, you know, that Jesus died for our sins and so forth, which uh, is alien to Platonism as far as I know it. I don't think there is a, a Platonic Messiah. And Christianity is just emphatically messianic. You know, it's based on a Messiah who died for our sins, and that's how you go to heaven is through him. And I really don't see that in Platonism, although I'm no authority on Platonism. And there is just a lot of sort of <clears throat> Old Testament Jewish beliefs that are brought into it also. Although some scholars will say that a lot of Old Testament Jewish beliefs also had Platonic influences because the Old Testament isn't as old as tradition would tell us it is. So anyways, you got number three, balance in the West began tipping with Aquinas, Occam, and the scholastics or nominalists in the Middle Ages shift from Plato to Aristotle. Um, yeah, I suppose so. Aquinas is, is known for having uh, sort of, to some degree, uh, integrated like Aristotelian philosophy with Christianity. But, I'm no authority on St. Thomas Aquinas either. And then finally, you get to the interesting one. <laughs> At least interesting to me. The Marvel Universe is basically a rebirth of a pagan religion. And yeah, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, there's there aren't people like making sacrifices to Spider-Man. I mean, you might have some weirdo out there who's doing it. I'm sure there must be at least somebody doing it. And also in India, too, there are probably people watch the Marvel movies in India and they're convinced that the Silver Surfer is, is this god, you know, maybe the Silver Surfer is like, you know, like Mercury or something. 
not in India, because I don't know who the, the Indian equivalent of Mercury would be or <clears throat> Hermes. And please excuse me for clearing my throat a lot. I think it's this fruit juice has an effect on that too. I'll just drink more of it and shamelessly continue clearing my throat. So, yeah, I think the pagans were taking their mythology more seriously than Marvel Universe fans. I mean, people who used to be Marvel Universe fans up until Marvel and Disney, who bought out the Marvel Universe, just started turning everything into like progressive propaganda. You know, replacing all the, the traditionally white male superheroes with females and, and colored people and so forth. People of color, I should say. And homosexuals and all, you know, all the rest. Any, anything that's diverse. So the Marvel Universe is collapsing, not because it's being replaced by some, some different universe that makes more sense. Sort of like what happened with classical paganism. You know, it just got eclipsed by Christianity. Uh, partly because Christianity answered the needs of the people to some degree more. And it was, in a way, sort of the opening of the heart chakra in mainstream Western civilization. And also just the his hysterical intolerance of early Christians just drove all other systems into extinction. So, yeah, it's kind of a loose parallel with some overlap, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that the Marvel Universe is basically a rebirth of pagan religion. It's going to take some doing for the rebirth of a pagan religion, unless something like Indian Hinduism becomes very much in fashion in the West or some such. Because Hinduism is essentially a pagan religion. So I'm just going to move on to the next question here. This is from Rui. And Rui says, as a mendicant, how often did you daydream, if at all? Do you remember, or do you consider it just another st strain of the inner monologue? Or do its voluntary and deliberate aspects place daydreaming in a league of its own? Okay, so this is two questions. i got to separate these. And I'll answer the first one first. As a mendicant, how often did you daydream, if at all? Well, this is kind of an embarrassing question because I have to admit, I did daydream kind of a lot as a monk. Sometimes you're meditating, you're meditating, your meditation just isn't going well. You know, you're just sitting there and, you know, you just start daydreaming, you know, like fantasizing about stuff, sometimes fantasizing about inappropriate stuff. Um... You know, like daydreaming about if if I was like a Roman emperor and I had the same knowledge then that I have now, you know, what could I do to prevent Christianity from taking over the empire? That kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I did daydream considerably. I still do. I, I've, I've sort of been a daydreamer all my life. You're just sort of working out these scenarios in your head. At least that's my version of it. And so I'm just going to move on to Rui's second question here. Which is, do you consider it just another strain of the inner monologue? Or do its voluntary and deliberate aspects place daydreaming in a league of its own? Well, my father told me. He, my father was a hypnotist. A, a amateur hypnotist. He didn't do it for a living. And he told me that daydreaming is a mild trance state. And I guess if you're daydreaming, you're like you're really daydreaming. Not just like thinking something casually, but you're kind of, you know, really into this daydreaming stage that you are in kind of a dreamy state. You know, it's, it's almost like dreaming while you're awake. That's why it's called daydreaming, I guess. And so it could be considered a mild trance state. <sighs> um, so I guess I answered that question. Pretty sure. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Siovaksh and Sipad Zidana. And Siovaksh and Sipad Zidana left a link to a, it was like a sermon given by Malcolm X back in the 60s, I assume. And he says, please check out this video from 1725 to 27 minutes. My question is, what are your thoughts on what Malcolm X says here in his religious sermon? If you think he's right about conceptions of a soul and afterlife in terms of how early Israelites actually thought of these matters. What Buddhist tradition 
would think of some of the various ideas he presented, especially of what a soul is, which seems more like life force or jiva here. If a belief in an afterlife leads to it being a coping mechanism for the downtrodden to continue tolerating their social conditions in this life, as Malcolm X says, and any other thoughts you had from the section of the video. Yeah, I watched most of it. I didn't get all the way to the 27 minute mark, but I, I, I watched most of it or listened to it because there was no video accompanying it other than just a still photograph of, of Malcolm himself. So um, my thoughts about what Malcolm X says, well, first he's talking a lot about the soul and he's essentially denying the existence of any kind of soul as commonly understood in Christianity that he's saying that, uh, you know, I mean, he, he uses the Bible as an authority, even though, uh, I mean, I don't know much about Malcolm X at all. I thought he was like a Muslim or something, but he's, uh, he continually mentions the honorable Elijah Muhammad that he, that Malcolm X in this sermon seems to be portraying himself as a kind of apostle for the honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he gives a list of, you know, the, the, the what were considered to be the, the um, genuine prophets that Muhammad accepted, you know, going back to like, um, I can't remember the first one, you know, somebody like uh, Enoch or something maybe, but then he mentions Moses, he mentions Elijah, he mentions Jesus, he mentions Muhammad himself, and then he mentions as the, the most recent prophet, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who, I mean, I have never heard of the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad before. So he, he apparently was a flash in the pan. He didn't last very long as a genuine prophet, as far as I can tell. So anyways, <clears throat> this Malcolm X, who apparently is not a Christian, nevertheless is using the Bible to prove points apparently to a group of Christians. And he's talking about how, um, how Adam was made, how God took some dirt from the earth and breathed life into it. And then it became a living soul. And he put a lot of emphasis on that. He spent a, a large portion of the 10 minutes or so that I was supposed to watch just emphasizing that, that he, God didn't implant a soul into Adam, that just by breathing life into this dirt, this soil, that Adam became a living soul. But before that, he was a dead soul. And then presumably after he died, he became a dead soul again. And then um, Malcolm X is talking about how this, a soul is essentially just a being. You know, you say that, you know, 20 souls died in that plane crash or someone is is like a, you know, an intelligent person. You say they're an intelligent soul. You know, it just means that soul just means any kind of being. And then before they're born, you know, they're still, they're still a soul. They're just a dead soul. And then when they're alive, they're a living soul. And after they die, they're a dead soul again. And he seems to be just completely dismissing the very idea of any kind of afterlife and that he's reducing soul just to being, you know, just any kind of organism, apparently. And my guess is, I don't know this for sure, but Malcolm X, it may be that he was a Marxist and he was just trying to, like, inoculate Marxist ideas like Marxist atheism and, you know, when you're dead, you're dead, materialism and all that, into the understanding of these Christian black people who he wasn't really satisfied with because he was saying that, I mean, so long as you believe in an afterlife, you're, you're never going to stop being slaves. You know, it's, it was like his purpose is trying to get black people to rise up and do something. And not enough of them were doing it for his, for his, uh, his liking. And so he's just telling them, and if, if you just, putting up with your situation in the hopes of going to heaven afterwards, then you're, you're never going to stop being a slave, that kind of thing. And I just do not think Malcolm X was a very religious or spiritual person, that he was more of a political agitator and possibly a Marxist. That's just 
the impression I get for lis from listening to him talk for 10 minutes because I'd never had any interest in Malcolm X before that, and I still don't have much interest in Malcolm X. So I guess I answered his question. I mean, it is it does it did kind of remind me a little bit of one of the questions that the Buddha refused to answer, and that is, is or, or actually two questions that the Buddha refused to answer, is the life force or the jiva the same as the body or separate from the body? And the Buddha just wouldn't answer that question. But uh, Malcolm X answered it. And he's saying it's apparently the same as the body, that your, your soul is your body. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I took away from what Malcolm X was saying. And that, but then it's like before you're born, before you exist, still you're kind of a dead soul. But I mean, he uses soul just as a person. You know, it's just any kind of being is a soul. I mean, he doesn't really differentiate between soul and, and being. So that's it. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think you're going to learn very much spirituality from listening to Malcolm X lectures. So I'm just going to move on to Siovac and Sipad Zidana's next question here, which is, does the theory of Rupa Kalapas from Ab Abhidhamma and the three gunas from Sankhya tradition contradict the five element model in Buddhism? Well, I don't think there is a five element model in Buddhism unless it's, let's see, mind, mental states. Yeah, okay. Wait, mind, mental states, consciousness. No, there's there's four. There's four elements in Orthodox Theravada. I think Mahayana Buddhism, maybe some of the non-Theravadan earlier schools added the fifth element of ether or space. So that might be the fifth element that Siovac and Sipad Zidana is referring to here. But in Buddhism, it's just earth, water, wind, and fire are the, the four elements. Or if you want to get into the four ultimate realities of Abhidhamma philosophy, then it would be mind, mental states, matter, and Nibbana. And let's see, the theory of Rupa Kalapas and the three gunas from Sankhya. And I guess I might as well explain that to anyone who's read the, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, for example, knows that there's the there's like the three gunas, the three qualities, which are sattvic, which is rep symbolically represented by the color white, rajasic, symbolically represented by the color red, and tamasic, which is symbolic symbolically represented by the color black, if white and black are colors. And food especially has... <clears throat> has these gunas in it, like sattvic food, which would be sort of an Ayurvedic Hindu kind of diet of nuts, grains, fruits, and dairy products, that kind of thing. Uh, rajasic food. I mean, sattvic is, is with regard to wisdom and purity, you know, sattva, or yeah, forget, 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 forget me just saying sattva, but it's, it, it is conducive to like purity and spiritual growth. Rajasic which would be like meat and spicy food especially, is conducive to rajas or, or lust or passion. You know, it kind of gets your juices flowing, gets you riled up more so than sattvic food, which helps you to calm down. And then there's tamasic food, which, uh, I mean, if you read the text, it's usually referring to like stale food or food that's kind of gone off. Although I've I asked an Ayurvedic, specialist once what would be a good example of tamasic food i asked him like blue cheese maybe he said mushrooms just emphatically just mushrooms that's tamasic food also on the discord server um that i was looking at recently they, they put eggs somebody said that eggs are also tamasic so um and with that as a kind of a rambling introduction to this question does the theory of Rupa Kalapas, oh, I didn't even mention Rupa Kalapas yet. According to Abhidhamma philosophy, there's a bunch of ultimately real elements or dharmas that fit into four main categories, which is mind, mental states, physical matter, and Nibbana. In mind or consciousness, there's really only one kind of that. Nibbana or Nirvana, there's only one kind of that. But there's 28 different kinds of matter and gosh, I can't remember. It's, it's a high number of mental states. And so 
a rupa kalapa is like an atom or a molecule and these these individual realities can exist by themselves they always appear in these little clumps or clusters that are called rupa kalapas so and, and it's same with mind and matter there are, there are mental rupa kalapas and and like physical rupa kalapas um so anyways no i guess I guess a rupa kalapa would have to be physical because rupa means matter. So it's it's sort of like the ancient Indian the ancient Indian Buddhist attempt at describing reality and it's it's sort of like their own atomic theory. And so Siovach and Sipat Zidana here is asking if the theory of the rupa kalapa is from Abhidhamma and the three gunas from Sankhya tradition contradict the five element model in Buddhism, which in Theravada Buddhism anyway, is the four element model. And I don't see how it would contradict the four element model in Theravada, at least the, the Rupa Kalapa theory. I mean, you could probably find ways that it could arguably contradict it. But um, yeah, it's, it's pretty well worked out, I think. But the three gunas, I don't think it contradicts anything. It's just sort of an an extra additional theory that isn't necessarily contradicting anything. It's just, it's just another one that's on the side of, of Buddhist philosophy, but uh, it doesn't necessarily contradict anything that I'm aware of any more than sort of like Chinese medicine and its belief in qi would necessarily contradict anything unless you're going to say that the three gunas really don't fit into the Abhidhamma's model of these ultimate realities. It's not one of the ultimate realities. And like Chinese Qi really doesn't fit into Abhidhamma either in that, in that regard. Well, this is kind of a strange, subtle question. It's, um, yeah. Does the theory of Rupa Kalapas from Abhidhamma and three gunas from Sankhya tradition contradict the five element model in buddhism it's just kind of a weird question really and i don't even i'm not even sure what the five element model in buddhism is unless he's talking about the five khandas or something maybe that's what he's referring to is the five khandas or the five aggregates <clears throat> i'm not sure you may have to ask it again i'm going to move on to the next question which coincidentally is from white malcolm x and white malcolm x says does it go against vinya to serve as the absolute theocratic ruler of a country if you live in a country where the constitution calls for rule by a buddhist monk not an immediate concern for me but i just want to know what the rules are in case it ever comes up in the future and i think he had asked this question specifically with regard to the Dalai Lama, who I mentioned in the previous Q&A, is pretty much of a monk, but also he's pretty much the, the secular king of, of Tibet, or I guess the, the spiritual, like the theocratic king of Tibet. So with regard to the Vinaya rules, is, is being a, an absolute theocratic ruler of a country against against Vinaya, well, it just, there's no rule about it. I mean, there, there was no chance that it would happen. I mean, it was just assumed that monks renounce the world in Vinaya. You know, they just kind of, they don't have anything to do with the government other than possibly just hanging out with government ministers and the occasional king, just, you know, discussing philosophy, sort of like Alexander the Great used to hang out with philosophers. Um, but there is this one this one rule, this one strange rule in the text, in, in Vinaya, which says, the Buddha says, monks, I allow you to obey kings. And that was with regard to changing the calendar. The king has the right to add an intercalary month to the year. So the king can decree there's going to be 13 months this year, and it's going to happen you know, in between this, this regular month and that regular month. We're going to add an extra one just to keep the you know, the cycles of the moon more or less in sync with the year because a lunar calendar and the Buddhist calendar is like lunisolar. It's partly based on the phases of the moon and partly based on like the, the sidereal year. 
So, <clears throat> oh man, I'm confusing myself. So anyways, the rule that says I allow you to obey kings was originally set up for monks to accept the, the king's decree that there's going to be a change in the calendar that year. But, I mean, the rule itself just says, I allow you to obey kings. And so, if you just happen, if the monk happens to be a king, then it's sort of like a president being able to pardon himself. You know, he can just make a decree. It's okay for, for me to be the king. And then it seems like that one obscure rule about obeying kings, um, it, might, it might be a way of it, a kind of a loophole. Gosh, but then again, I mean, if if you're a king, if the if the monk became a king, and he's like having people put to death or something, then I don't think he'd be able to pardon himself or absolve himself from being excommunicated. But I guess the long and the short of it, the short answer to this is Vinia does not have any rules at all against becoming a theocratic ruler of a country. Just because, I mean, it just wasn't going to happen. Just like there's no rule against smoking tobacco in Vinaya because tobacco had not been introduced into India yet at that time. There's no rule against uh, a monk having a smartphone, partly because smartphones had not existed yet when the rules were made. And it just didn't occur to anybody to make a rule against a monk becoming an absolute monarch. So I assume it would be okay so long as he's not uh, like having drone strikes or, or having, you know, killing people or ordering the deaths of people, which pretty much all pre U.S. presidents do anyway. I assume that the king of some obscure little third world country somewhere won't necessarily be ordering the death of anybody unless it's a banana republic in which, you know, he might be ordering the death of anyone who opposes him. But, um, I mean, this, this whole question reminds me of the Tamiya Jataka, which is, I mean, I, I've considered even making a video of just me reading the Tamiya Jataka. It's, it's this story about the previous existence of the Buddha before he was enlightened. And his father was a king. And one time when he was a toddler, <clears throat> he was sitting on his father's lap on the throne while he was judging cases. And he was having people, you know, sentenced to execution by various grisly ways you know bandits were brought in front of him and you know he'd have you know top of their skull opened up and like molten lead poured into their skull this kind of stuff which did happen in the buddhist time they had grisly public executions to strongly you know dissuade people from taking up a life of crime it didn't entirely work of course but still it happened and so the little kid who is the future Buddha, he sees, he, he realizes that if when he grows up to be the king, he's going to have to do this kind of stuff because that's part of the job of being a king. And so he just pretended to be a deaf mute for, for, from then on. And so he just grows up with everyone believing he's a deaf mute until finally the king in despair just has him taken out to be put to death. You know, you just send, send some lackey out and and takes him out to the woods to kill him and then after the the lackey the servant of the king takes tamia out into the forest then Tamiya all of a sudden starts talking and showing them that he's not a deaf mute and he pretty much converts him to you know proto buddhism and so tamia just goes off and becomes a monk and then eventually everybody in the entire kingdom goes to visit him and they all get converted to, to this proto Buddhism and they all renounce the world until all that's left in the kingdom is just a few derelicts like drunks and so forth. But I mean, the moral of the story is if, if you're going to be a King, you got to do immoral things like having people put to death. And uh, so that may be a conflict with being a monk living in accordance with Vinaya. Whether the Dalai Lama does anything like that, I assume they've got systems in place where you've got you know, other people making the calls with regard to executing criminals and so forth.
But, I mean, the short answer is no, it does not go against Vinaya to serve as an absolute theocratic ruler of a country, <clears throat> partly just because it never occurred to anyone to make a rule against it. So I'm just going to move on to the next question here, which is from Rybalder. And Rybalder says, is bummer a best word to describe or translate dukkha? And I would say that it's not the best word. Otherwise, in my own translations, I would have been translating dukkha as bummer. But um, yeah, bummer, I mean, bummer is, an, is a noun, I'm pretty sure. I don't think it can really be turned into an adjective very easily. And dukkha can be a noun or an adjective. But uh, dukkha, I mean, it's notoriously difficult to translate. And it's usually translated as suffering. But dukkha means any kind of negative feeling, you know, from just the mildest discomfort to the most unbearable agony. And there's no real equivalent in the English language for that. So translators usually just fall back on suffering or they, just, they leave it untranslated, like especially lately translators will just leave certain terms untranslated just because there is no good English translation and dukkha is one of them. Although um, I usually use the word unease, which uh, it's kind of nice in that <clears throat> it, it pairs well with ease. Like, like dukkha pairs with sukha. Sukha is the opposite of dukkha. So dukkha is suffering and sukha is like happiness you know, positive, positivity, negativity and positivity. Whereas, you know, in my translation scheme, it's unease and ease. So it works that way. There's more of a balance, especially like in poetry and so forth. It just seems to be a smoother kind of a translation than suffering. Although uh, Anjan Tanisro uses stress, which, uh, I don't know, it's maybe distress would work better than stress but i'm sure he's got his reasons um in like a modern parlance like street language um yeah i was thinking you know, like if you were to translate the first noble truth into like street language it'd be like everything's bullshit i still wouldn't say bummer like maybe bullshit would be better than bummer so yeah i would not consider bummer to be the best word to describe or translate dukkha although you know, it's, there, there are a lot worse words you could use. Bummer. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of applicable. So anyways, Reibalder's second question is uh, similar, which is, what are your top six words to describe or translate dukkha? And I really don't have a top six list of favorite translations for the word dukkha. I mean, my own favorite, like I already mentioned, it would be unease. And the suffering is kind of all right. And I guess we can throw bullshit in there for the street people. And stress by Ajahn Tinisaro, and, and yeah, I never really favored that one. And I mean, we're already, we've only got up to like four there and there's still two to go. So yeah, negativity or something, but um, all you really need is one good word to translate it and you don't really need to have a list of five alternates in 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 order of preference so i've never really come up with six words six of my top favorite words for describing or translating dukkha i guess just leaving it untranslated might count as an option but um i guess i answered that as well as i'm as well as I'm inclined or able to answer it. <clears throat> so I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is from PSA. And PSA says, are Samaneras allowed to masturbate? Or does the precept, precept prohibiting intentional release of semen apply to Samaneras as well? So a Samanera <clears throat> is a novice. It's usually the English word is for Samanera is novice, a Buddhist novice. And they are, have to keep 10 precepts plus the Sekia rules, which are mainly just like rules regarding etiquette, you know, politeness and so forth. You know, just proper respect for Dhamma <clears throat> and advocating that with regard to lay people and so forth. So, yeah, technically speaking, 
there is no rule. It's not against the 10 precepts for a novice to masturbate, to cause himself to have an orgasm on purpose. But um, different cultures, like Theravada Buddhist cultures, like Burmese culture, would consider it to be a no-no. And any monk who does, or any Samanera who does that, any novice who does that, would have to take the precepts over again. But the Burmese have some strange ideas. They think that a Samanera, if he takes all of his clothes off and gets all the way naked, he's got to take all the precepts over again. Because somehow taking your clothes off makes you stop being a Samanera. And they've got this weird technical explanation for it that I no longer clearly remember. But, um, yeah, I mean, masturbating not to orgasm, technically even a monk can do that, even though it's certainly not recommended. But, uh, yeah, the, the precept prohibiting intentional release of semen is, uh, if I remember correctly, it's the first Sangha di Sesa rule. And... Salmoneras don't have to follow the Sangha di Sesa rules. So, I mean, they have to be celibate. So, I mean, it could be considered sensual misconduct, which would be included in celibacy. For a Salmonera or anyone taking 10 precepts. So, yeah, I think technically speaking, there's no rule against it. But different Buddhist traditions will have... I mean, obviously, they're going to come across that because you got teenage boys who are Salmoneras in these Southeast Asian or South Asian Buddhist cultures who are going to spank the puppy sometimes if they can get away with it. So, yeah, I think that uh, the individual traditions will, will have an answer for that. And they'll say, yeah, you're not allowed to do it. Although I have been told that a lot of novices do masturbate. And as I say, technically speaking, there is no explicit rule against it. So I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is from Mogambo. And this also was, uh, <clears throat> this was a comment to a different video. It wasn't a comment to the Q and a video, but I came across it. Um, so Mogambo says it wasn't there a tetralemma-like concept in the Attika Laga. And the tetralemma, oh, this is this was a comment that wasn't even to one of my videos, but he addressed me because I left a comment. It was religion for breakfast, I think, which is a, is a, a good channel on YouTube. He talks about various religious traditions. And he was talking about Greek Buddhists. So that was kind of interesting. And I watched it, it was an interesting video. He didn't really talk about Greek Buddhists in Europe or in the, the Roman Empire. He was talking about the like the Greek kingdom of Bactria and then the, the Bactrian Greeks invaded northwestern India. So you had like a Indo-Greek kingdom for a while. And so he was talking about the Greeks in Asia who converted to Buddhism and really didn't mention much of anything about Western Greeks like Greeks in actual Europe or in the Roman Empire that, that converted to Buddhism. But anyway, he was talking about the tetralemma, which is an aspect of Buddhist logic, which is, you know, every, every statement must fit into one of four categories. This is the tetralemma. So it's either true, it's false, it's true and false, or it's neither true nor false. Any statement would have to fit in to that tetralemma supposedly and so Mogambo here is wasn't there a tetralemma like concept in the Attika Waga and I mean the tetra the logical tetralemma is not mentioned in the Attika Waga that I can remember the closest I can think of with regard to the Attika Waga would be statements that a monk would not consider himself to be superior to others or inferior to others or equal to others that all of those are considered to be conceit or mana, which is kind of a strange idea that it's conceit to consider yourself inferior or, or equal to others. But mana here is just any kind of self-regard. Considering yourself to be anything is delusional. So that's about the closest I can come to the tetralemma in the Atikawaga, although um, it just kind of deals with the tetralemma by just saying, don't believe anything. 
So that would apply to the whole tetralemma. I mean, if you're not believing anything, you're not believing that A is true, you're not believing A is false, you're not believing that A is true and false, and you're not believing that A is neither true nor false. You're just dismissing the whole tetralemma. And that's kind of what Nagarjuna does later on, like in his Mula Majamaka Karaka, he applies the Buddhist logical tetralemma to statement after statement after statement and attempts to demonstrate that none of them really apply because the logic is just invalid. It's like any statement is bound to be just invalid and just won't even fit the tetralemma. And that's a development of what is this sort of implied in very early Buddhism, like in the Atikawaga. So, so the, I mean, the question again here is, wasn't there tetralemma-like concept in the Atikawaga? And not necessarily, although the whole tetralemma is kind of dismissed in some verses or some suttas. And also, as I said before, there is kind of a trilemma in that you don't consider yourself to be superior, you don't consider yourself to be inferior, and you don't consider yourself to be equal. So that would be kind of a trilemma, I guess. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from Fred. And Fred is kind of an unusual guy in that he, he'll just send questions everywhere. You know, he'll put questions in the Q&As. He'll put questions in the comments to other people in the Q&As. You know, he'll, he'll email me questions sometimes. And, so, and sometimes it's hard to tell whether he's really asking the question, expecting the answer or not. Because sometimes he'll just have sentences ending with question marks. But anyways, he did put this one in the Q&A. And so it would be a uh, fair game for answering this one, especially. And so I'm going to answer this one, which is Fred says, memory could be looking upstream, question mark. And I assume what he means is that memory is actually looking into the past. And I discussed this in a previous Q&A, not the one immediately before this one, but a few Q&As back where I was, somebody asked me about memory and it got me thinking, and I was thinking about memory more, is that it's really a kind of karmic phenomenon. It's like a mental momentum. That karma is like the momentum of your mental states. And memory is essentially the same thing. It's like the, the memory of certain images or impressions. It's, it's like the, the momentum of that through time. And so I really do not buy the idea that some philosophers, in all seriousness, have proposed that memory is just looking into the past, that you're like re-experiencing the past. But the very fact that memories can be faulty and pretty much any memory is bound to be faulty with regard to details. You know, if, 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 you, if you examine it closely enough, you're going to see that you might remember something very clearly that, and then it turns out that you remembered him wearing a white shirt when so-and-so did something such and such, but really he was wearing a light blue shirt or something. But very clearly in your mind, you see that white shirt because that's just kind of the version that you've settled upon and that you've reinforced over time by recalling it and just sort of like adding to the, the psychic momentum of it so it doesn't fade out as easily. So I do not believe that memory is directly looking into the past. It's just like the momentum through time of certain sensory impressions or perceptual impressions that just get reinforced every time you remember it you're conjuring up the image which then sort of adds to the momentum of it so i guess i answered that question so i'm moving on to the next one this is from yaroslav and yaroslav says is there for us any other than samsaric context well, the only context you're, you could possibly have would be samsaric because there is no context in ultimate reality. There is no text. There is no con. No context. So context itself is a samsaric phenomenon of just integrating different ideas, you know, fitting together pieces of a puzzle. And there are no various pieces of a puzzle in, in like nirvana. So 
if you mean is there any context for us other than some a samsaric one then i would have to say no but i mean it could be interpreted differently this question could is there for us any other than you know some sort of context i mean is there something other than a context for us i mean you could say i mean there's we're pervaded by by the absolute by ultimate reality by the highest truth whatever you want to call it god Tao, the dharmakaya whatever you want to call that but it's not really for us it's just weird just kind of superimposed over it and we're just not as real as it is. So, I mean, even us, just assuming us as real, then you're already, I mean, you're, you're already assuming that there are these multiple individual entities that ultimately don't exist. So, yeah, I mean, you can say that, I mean, there's the potential at least for something other than or higher than a samsaric context. But it's not really for us. That The us is what is in the way of that. The us is what is in the way of anything other than a samsaric context. So I'm just going to move on to the next question here. This is from Eddie. And Eddie says, can you all list your favorite texts and books and other sources for enlightenment or deepening awakening? So my favorite texts or books, man, for enlightenment or deepening awakening. Gosh. Well, I mean, somebody asked a similar question down here, and I, I kind of put in a few notes down below. So I'll just, I'll just skip to that. Okay. Somebody, somebody asked a similar question, but they were asking for specifically Buddhist sources. So my favorite Buddhist sources, I mean, I don't know if it's, you could even call it as a source for like how to become awakened. Um, but like Sutta Nipata was like my main inspiration as a Theravada Buddhist. Um, it's pretty much converted me to Theravada Buddhism and just the ideal of the, the wandering ascetic life really appealed to me. So, I mean, not all texts in the Sutta Nipata are equally good. There, there is a certain amount of dead wood even in the Sutta Nipata. Um, the Udana, uh, first suttas of just about any collection, because the editors or compilers of the, the suttas usually put like some old, important suttas right at the very beginning of each collection. Like the entire Sagata Vaga of the Samyutta Nikaya is considered to be relatively old and has a lot of important stuff in it. Um, like the beginning of the Mahavaga, like you know, of, of the Vinaya, that's, that's got a lot of really important or at least inspiring stuff in it. The Alagadupama Sutta of the, the Majjhima Nikaya, the Diga Naka Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya. Also just... Um, like the Zen koan collections, even some Mahayana texts like uh, um, the Diamond Cutter Sutra or the Heart Sutra. Let's see. Favorite texts and books and other sources for enlightenment or deepening awakening. Well, I mean, the book that originally got me interested in spirituality would be Grist for the Mill by Ram Das. A youth counselor gave me that to read when I was like 17 years old. Um... Yeah, a lot of Ram Das books. I read I read a lot of that. Um let's see. I mean, even some uh, stuff by what Richard Bach, like Jonathan Livingston Seagull or uh Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. Um let's see, Deepening Awakening. I mean, you might throw in like The Experience of Insight by Joseph Goldstein, which I think is probably like his first Dhamma book. Man, let's see what else. Yeah, I haven't I haven't really uh like systematically compiled any sort of list of like my favorites or what I consider to be important. Uh, Miracle of Love, which was uh about stories about Neem Karoli Baba by Ram Das. That one book gives gives you a feeling of being in the presence of an enlightened being more than any book I've read, I think. 
Although a lot of Orthodox Buddhists would say there's no way Neem Karoli Baba would be fully enlightened because he didn't act the way an Arhat is supposed to act according to Orthodox Theravada. Um, let's see. My favorite texts and books and other sources for enlightenment or deepening awakening. Well, maybe I shouldn't mention psychedelic drugs. But that, for my generation of monks, anyway, that was a common common occurrence you know starting with something like lsd or mushrooms that that gives you like a an, an expanded awareness like an alternative version of reality that in some ways seems more real than the ordinary waking state and then you get more into meditation and so forth as ways of cultivating the expanded awareness without having to use the chemical so Favorite texts and books and other sources for enlightenment or deepening awakening. Oh, there's another book called uh, In Each Moment by Paul Lowe that is well worth reading. That was one book that had a significant effect on my life in that it was one of the books that taught me that, I mean, just trying to live up to an exalted ideal is really pitting yourself against reality. Krishnamurti talks about this a lot too. But... Um, yeah, that, that one book by Paul Lowe was given to me by a friend. And it was just one of those cases of, you know, the, the just what you need to read or hear just falls into your lap at the right moment. But it's going to be different for different people. Some people are just profoundly moved by like Thomas Merton's The Seven Story Mountain, for example, which I read and, I mean, it was kind of interesting, but it uh, it didn't really do much for me. Uh, with regard to Christian books, like The Ascent of Mount Carmel by St. John of the Cross is profound. And, I mean, that can be helpful even for a Buddhist in that <clears throat> it's given you a different point of view at essentially the same issue of just purifying yourself and eradicating delusion from your mind. And i got a dog who's trying to dig a hole in his dog bed. Okay, then. <clears throat> so... I guess I listed off a lot. Of, there's, I do have certain favorite books that really don't have much to do with uh, enlightenment or deepening awakening. I mean, at least they probably didn't help me to become uh, an as expanded or wise or whatever as I am now. Like my favorite novel is Dostoevsky's The Idiot, which is a profoundly religious, spiritual kind of story. But whether it helped me to deepen awakening or not is uh, questionable. So I guess I listened, I listened a bunch. So, um, let's see, can I think of any more? Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now is, is good. Krishnamurti, I mean, J. Krishnamurti is well worth reading. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's good. I'm just going to move on to the next question now. So this is from Austin. And Austin says, I'm going on a Goinka retreat next week. Any tips? It's going to be my first time doing a meditation retreat. Well, congratulations on that. Uh, I, I really don't have any tips. I'm not sure what kind of tips I would give you. I mean, if this were like several weeks in advance, I might give you the tip of, you know, just sit cross-legged a lot, just to get yourself used to it before you dive into a 10-day retreat that is going to be, consist of lots and lots of sitting. Going to retreats don't have walking meditation in between sitting sessions like like Mahasi retreats do. So um, I guess the only advice I would give you is just tough it out and last the whole 10, 10 days, even if it seems really horrible. Just stick it out, see what happens. But uh, aside from that, I'm not sure what kind of advice I would give you. Just do your best, you know. Try to try to follow the instructions of the teachers as well as you can. Although I guess at Goenka retreats, the instructions might all be just on like video or something. Just do your best. And I'm just going to move on to the next question here. This is from Jules. And Jules says, since returning to the worldly life, have you noticed any significant changes to your physiology? And yeah, I've noticed a few. First of all, after I stopped being a monk, I immediately gained about 25 pounds. 
largely due to the miracle of just being able to eat whatever I want to instead of once a day you eat what's put into your bowl and it's usually rice and like Asian stuff. <clears throat> so all of a sudden just being able to go to the refrigerator at any time of day or night and just take anything that I want and consume it without breaking any rules. That was, that was kind of nice. So also with regard to my physiology, um, I, I'm no, I get fatigue more now that I feel more tired than I did when I was a monk. That it's just like a drain on my life force, especially, I mean, working for a living, you know, I'm working in a sheet metal shop and I'm moving around all day and, and sometimes lifting heavy stuff and carrying it around and, you know, doing a fair amount of, of physical exertion. Um, but also just not being a monk anymore, just being plunged back into like worldly secular samsara and having to navigate, you know, through all the stuff that a lay person has to navigate. It, it definitely has caused me to feel more tired more often. So those would be the two main significant changes in my physiology. I just gained 25 pounds, just boom. And, uh, got somewhat of a gut now, although it's a hard gut. It's not a soft, flabby gut. It's, it's, a, it's a firm gut. And uh, just, uh, I get tired a lot easier now, partly because as a monk, I was just a member of the leisure class. You know, I just didn't have to do very much if I didn't want to. And uh, I just, my, my life force just, you know, was just kind of wasn't drained away by having to do all this other stuff that now it, it is. So I guess, I guess I answered that question. So I'm going to move on to the next one here, which is part two of Jules's first question. If so, have these physiological changes had any good or bad consequences in terms of your ability to practice mindfulness? It's, it's hard to say really, because my practice is different now. It's not nearly as systematic as it was before. Um, I mean, the tiredness, I mean, maybe, I guess. But I mean, the main, the main effects on my ability to practice mindfulness is really just all the distractions of living a worldly life. You know, you're at work and you're interacting with other people and so forth. And you just kind of get sucked into the idea that samsara is reality. You start taking it seriously. I and mean, that happens as a monk also. But um, that's like the main obstacle, I guess, to mindfulness is just getting sucked into um, just taking everything seriously. And, and also, um, see, what was I going to say? I was going to say something else. It's, this thought occurred to me. Uh, now I, I lost it again. Yeah, I don't think that really how much you weigh is going to have much influence on your mindfulness. And this being tired, I, I mean, I wouldn't be tired if I were a monk or if I were a monk again or as tired, I suppose. So let's see, what was it? Your ability to practice mindfulness. I mean, having a certain amount of quietness and so forth. So really the, the, the differences in my ability to practice mindfulness are not really physiological. It's just more a difference of lifestyle that being a lay person is a higher difficulty setting for that. So I guess, I guess I answer that. So I'm going to move on to the next question. This is from Lieberlam and Lieberlam always asks these questions that are, I mean, even if they're not very long, sometimes you got to really concentrate to try and figure out what he's saying. And so anyways, Lieberlam says, is it skillful to view Mara in an animistic way along the lines of the illusion being cleverly crafted to be like an oppositional war front to victory in spiritual life? So I'm not exactly sure what he means by animistic here. Mara is like the Buddhist devil. You know, Mara is the tempter. Mara is the one who tries to keep you from becoming enlightened. Mara and his three voluptuous daughters. <clears throat> so Lieberlam is asking, is it skillful to view Mara 
in an animistic way along the lines of the illusion being cleverly crafted to be like an oppositional war i mean who is cleverly crafting it that was like the first thing that arose when i was reading this is who is cleverly crafting the uh the opposition to your becoming enlightened i mean it seems to me that mara is redundant mara is unnecessary because generally we don't really want to become enlightened anyway and even if we do we get in our own way I mean, we don't need some cosmic bad guy to throw obstacles in front of us because we throw obstacles in front of ourselves and Mara couldn't throw the obstacle unless it was our own karma for him to do it. So whether it's skillful or not, I mean, you can become enlightened following Buddhism in which you consider Mara to be this real cosmic bad guy who is you know, trying to prevent people from becoming enlightened. Just because by becoming enlightened, that's the only way they're going to escape from his realm. He's not just the god of, of hell. He's the god of all of samsara. He's the god of heaven and earth and hell. And so the only way to escape from Mara's realm is to become enlightened and just bail out of the system, to get completely out of the 31 planes of existence. And he doesn't want that. <sighs> According to tradition, Although, as I say, I consider Mara to be kind of just redundant. I mean, there's really no need for him because most of us don't want to become enlightened anyway. So, yeah. I mean, you, you got to figure out, I mean, who it is that's cleverly crafting the, the illusion. And that's us, we ourselves are cleverly crafting it. So it's, it'd be like our own subconscious mind which would be sort of like the, the main story of, or the main message of Lord of the Flies, the book and not the, the dumb movies. The, I mean, the movies just completely dismissed the, the deeper philosophical symbolism or largely dismissed it. And they're just trying to show a story about kids on an island. But I mean, Lord of the Flies, and that's, that's the English translation of Beelzebub. And you know the whole story, uh, at least at one level, is about the devil and the nature of the devil. And the whole point of the story is that, I mean, the devil doesn't really exist out there. The, the devil is internal. It's like everyone has like these dark corners in their mind and on a collective scale that becomes Satan, the monster. And so you could view Mara kind of that way, but it wouldn't be animistic. But, I mean, Mara could be cleverly crafting out the opposition to our enlightenment at that level somehow, I guess. But for the most part, we're, I mean, we're an oppositional war with ourselves. It's like someone who's trying to become enlightened, they're at a war with the part of themselves that doesn't want to become enlightened. You know, it's an internal war. It's like a civil war in Mara, in my opinion. Just like Satan who didn't even get invented until, um, you know, the Babylonian captivity, that they're just getting redundant and unnecessary. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Not Henry Porter. And Not Henry Porter says, If I kill a bug, aren't I doing it a favor? It's the lowest rung of life and living a miserable existence. If I put it out of its misery, I take a tiny karmic hit, but it gets the karmic benefit of having been murdered and hopefully moves on to a better incarnation. I like to joke about this when it comes up, but is there any truth in it? Also, are beings supposedly conscious when they incarnate as an insect, which science suggests are essentially like robots? So I guess that's two questions. I got to separate these. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. It didn't happen. What happened here? What happened? Oh, okay, I did it. All right. So, first question is, if I kill a bug, aren't I doing it a favor? It's the lowest rung of life and living a miserable existence. I, and if I put it out of its misery, I take a tiny karmic hit, but it gets the karmic benefit of having been murdered and hopefully moves on to a better incarnation. Well, I mean, I don't think that insects are miserable. I don't think you're putting an insect out of its misery. Even a dying insect, 
there's a good chance you know like when when a bug will just flip over onto its back and start kicking its legs in the air for no apparent reason you know it's a goner then but even then i kind of doubt that it's miserable i don't think that insects suffer in that way so you might say that you're doing it a favor but then again i mean euthanasia or killing people that are considered to be inferior in some way i mean you could use the same kind of argument for that you know you're just you're doing it a favor it's the lowest rung of life and living a miserable existence but they might see things differently so yeah you're not really putting it out of its misery because i really don't think an insect has any misery to speak of and another thing that most Western Buddhists and a lot of Eastern Buddhists also just kind of ignore or dismiss is the idea that Buddhist ethics are subjective. They're not, I mean, the ethical quality of an act really is not a matter of what you're doing, you know, outwardly. It's, it's your own mental states while you're doing it that determine the ethical value of the act and the karmic value of the act. So... I doubt that anyone's going to go to hell just for killing a bug, but I don't think that they're doing anything good necessarily by killing a bug. Or if it is, it could be like the lesser of two evils. Let's say you've got a child who's got lice in his hair. It's your duty as the parent to get rid of the parasites, which is probably going to wind up in the parasites dying. But I mean, you're doing it for the health of your child and to prevent your child from being a vector of, of like contagion of these lice. So sometimes you would have to take the hit doing that. And it could be that overall you may be doing more good than bad, even though you are doing a certain amount of unwholesome activity by killing, like knowingly and willingly killing living beings. So yeah, I don't think that, yeah, I would not go along with the argument that, by killing a bug, you're doing it a favor. I mean, in all likelihood, it's just going to get reborn as a as another bug anyway. And, I mean, you, you've harmed yourself more than you've harmed the insect, which is kind of getting to the second part of this question, in which he says, also are being supposedly conscious when they incarnate as an insect, which science suggests are essentially like robots. Yeah, I consider insects to be like little robots too. Um... <clears throat> I do think that an insect probably has some kind of consciousness and maybe even some kind of sensation, but I do not think that they've got volition or perception. They don't have like a, a internal mental image that they're going with. I, they certainly don't have any kind of inner dialogue that they have like this simple primordial kind of consciousness. I think even plants have that. I think even so-called inanimate matter has a kind of extremely primitive consciousness. You know, a, a hydrogen atom has like this tiny, you know, this atomic speck of consciousness to it. The, the brain does not generate consciousness. I mean, science is just totally at a loss as to how the brain would generate conscious experience. It's just, it's a non-starter. They don't know how where to begin with that. And an insect, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it doesn't have the same kind of brain as us, so it wouldn't have the same kind of consciousness or the same kind of mentality as us. But I would assume that even an insect has like this tiny little spark of consciousness to it, even if it's not making decisions, even if it doesn't have any kind of mental image, you know, no self-awareness, but still this rudimentary little spark of consciousness. And... Um, the idea that a human being could be reborn as an insect, I'm very skeptical of that. I mean, there's just too much going on in the human mind to somehow get implanted into an insect. I just, uh, I mean, maybe, it, I think it'd be pushing it, even be reincarnated as an entire hive, you know, a hive of bees or something. I, I, it's, it'd be so alien to human consciousness that I think that it, it's extremely unlikely. So, yeah, if a human is reborn, they're going to be reborn as something similar to a human, if not exactly a human, in my opinion. 
So I guess I answered not Henry Porter's question there. So I'm going to move on to the next one. And this is from Pranav. And Pranav says, how do, how do the Burmese celebrate Vesak Purnima? And how is it different from the way you celebrate it? And for those of you who are not like fluent Buddhists, Vesak Purnima literally means the full moon of Visaka. And the full moon of Visaka is Buddha Day. So, I mean, I, I looked this up. I, I didn't know what day exactly Wisak Wisak was going to be this year. So I looked it up and it's going to be Thursday, May 23rd of the year 2024. And the website actually says that this day is the celebration of the birth of Gautama Buddha. And it didn't start off as the celebration of the birth of Gautama Buddha. It started off being the celebration of his enlightenment. The Buddha became enlightened. Usually, on going with the Western calendar, it usually is around the full moon of May. So later tradition, I assume, they didn't know when the Buddha was born exactly or, or exactly what day he died. And so they just combined Vesak into a, like a threefold celebration of his birth, his enlightenment, and his death. Somehow, according to tradition, the Buddha was born, he became enlightened on his birthday, and he died on his birthday. Which, just going with statistics, is kind of unlikely. Um, but I think it's a fairly well-established tradition that at least he became enlightened on the full moon of May. That was a tradition going way back. And how did the Burmese celebrate Buddha Day? is the way they celebrate just about any holiday, which is, you know, they eat lots of good food. You know, they'll cook meat that day in the village. They'll go to the monastery and they'll feed the monks. The monks will give a sermon. They'll, and after that, they'll, they'll take precepts and then they'll just sit around talking and, and drinking tea and, you know, munching on, you know, Burmese delicacies and so forth. And then they go home. You know, they'll offer stuff to the monks probably. And they'll earn good, they'll earn merit for that. And then they'll share their merit. And then they'll just go back home again. That's pretty much the description of any Burmese Buddhist holiday. You know, you go to the monastery, you offer stuff to the monks, you feed the monks, you listen to a, a discourse, you take the precepts and the, you take the three refuges, you share your merits, you drink lots of tea, you eat a lot, you talk with your friends, and then you go home again. And probably the most, a lot of Burmese people take eight precepts instead of just five on that day. And uh, how is that different from the way I celebrate it? I remember even when I was a monk in Burma, people would tell me that it's, it's Buddha day. And I'd say, you know, Buddha Nate. And I'd say, you know, every day is Buddha day. You know, it's, it's all the same. <laughs> I really did. I've never really been into celebrating holidays all that much anyway. So I just say, you know, every day is Buddha day and just continue being a monk, just, you know, doing monk stuff. I really didn't, I really was not into celebrating holidays. And I'm still not really into celebrating holidays, although, you know, sometimes it's, it is expected of you to uh, provide people with Christmas presents and so forth, which is, uh, you know, I can accept that. That's easily acceptable. But, uh, you know, every day for me is, is pretty much just another today. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from the Proto Pseudo Monk. Let's see here. Okay. And the Proto Pseudo Monk says, Vipassana and or jhana, how? So that's a short question. And he seems to be implying, as mainstream Orthodox Theravadan tradition implies, that you've got two different routes to enlightenment. And in Burma, some people will ask you, which sasana do you belong to? Do you belong to the vipassana sasana or the samatha sasana? And samatha would be jhana. It's like tranquility meditation. But I really am skeptical of the idea that the Buddha taught these two different ways of vipassana and samatha. That it just sort of got divide bifurcated later on doctrinally with you know different groups favoring you know one or the other and it just kind of caused a split 
but um, I mean, you should, I mean, you don't really practice Vipassana. And it's, it's unfortunate in my opinion that the term Vipassana came to be identified with just mindfulness practice, like Satipatthana. If you're practicing mindfulness, then it usually goes by the name of Vipassana in certain circles. But Vipassana is insight, which arises, and it can arise after you're just in a normal state of mindfulness, like momentary, momentary concentration, or it can arise after deep jhana states. So, I mean, it's not really either or. So, I mean, according to early tradition, like in the suttas, you're supposed to try to cultivate jhanas, and jhana may have meant something different than it does now in, in the Buddhist time. It could have just meant the four stages of meditation, which means that even like beginning elementary meditation, if you're doing it correctly, would count as first jhana. So then that would be even more of an indication there was no either or with regard to mindfulness or, or jhana. So a monk is supposed to be mindful as much as possible. You know, even if he's practicing jhana, I mean, it, in the text, fourth jhana is called purity of mindfulness. So <clears throat> your mindfulness gets even better if you're practicing jhana. So you just are mindful most of the time or mindful as much as you can. Cultivate deep meditative states as much as you can. And the deep meditative states will increase the likelihood of some kind of liberating insight arising. Some people don't need to get into very deep meditative states for liberating insight to arise, but others do. And so you just keep practicing and meditating and being as mindful as you can until you don't need to anymore. So I would say Vipassana and Jhana and the how would be pretty much what I just very briefly explained and is found throughout the suttas, that the idea that there are two different sasanas or two different teachings, one, it's just either or, that I, I really don't think so. So I think I'll just move on to the next question here. Also by the proto pseudo monk. He says, could you share your investigation and give an exhaustive list of all your favorite Buddhist texts the ones you consider to be the most reliable texts alleviate us Westerners capable of critical thinking to skip the fire-breathing dragons, talking animals, flat earth floating on the water, eclipses of the sun and moon being caused by a demon swallowing it into his mouth, etc. Well, I already mentioned uh, quite a few to, in, in response to a previous question. And, I mean, there is a difference between my favorite Buddhist texts and the ones I consider to be the most reliable or the most, most authentic, the most representative of what the historical Gautama Buddha really taught. You know, there's a difference that, I mean, I think all of the ones I consider to be really archaic Buddhist texts would be listed among my favorites, but not all of my favorites would be that way. There are some things that I just like that are in all likelihood, not authentic teachings. Like, like the Zen koan stories, for example, are pretty obviously not authentic teachings of the Buddha because they're not even attributed to the Buddha. Or the Diamond Cutter Sutra, the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation. Those are, I mean, the, the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation is attributed to Padmasambhava, who wasn't Gautama Buddha, but still it is profound and it would be one of my favorite Buddhist texts, even though it's Tibetan. It's one of the only Tibetan Buddhist texts I've ever read, really. That and the Tibetan Book of the Dead would be the two main ones. Uh, like the autobiography of Milarepa. I've re read a few, but um, still, just because I know that the Buddha didn't really teach something in particular doesn't mean that I, I can't still like it. Because the Buddha did not have a monopoly on wisdom. There are other wise people who say wise things and you can get, you can get benefit from listening to any wise person, not just, not just one. I've never really been the sort of person that would just restrict what I want to read down to what I consider the, the historical Gautama Buddha really taught. 
there are some Western monks who are like that. And maybe it's fortunate for them that they tend to believe that all of the core texts are reliable, which is about half of the Dipitaka. But, uh, I mean, you can't really be sure. And uh, so, so the texts that I already mentioned, um, at least they reduce the amount of like fairy tale narratives and so forth. Now, the Sutani Pata still it has a fair amount of like later texts, but it's got a higher percentage, I think, of really old stuff than most texts. The Udana is similar. It's got a lot of old stuff, a lot of old teachings, and then later it's got got some kind of weird mythological stuff added. Um, uh, like I mentioned before, like the first suttas of just about any collection are going to be put at the front just because they were considered to be so important and so profound. So you get a higher higher quality level from the first suttas of a collection than the average uh, quality of the entire collection. Like the Sagata Waga of the Samyutta Nikaya has a lot of profundity in it. Um, Vinaya has, I like... I like Vinaya as a Buddhist text, which doesn't so much tell you how to become enlightened so much as it's explaining kind of the atmosphere that Buddhism arose in, which kind of helps you get the spirit, so to speak. You know, if, if you can understand what it was like in ancient India, you know, in the Buddhist time, what it was like living then, you get more of a feel for, you know, how they were practicing than if you're just like, in an apartment in, in New York City or something, and you're just reading these texts while still being firmly rooted in like Western culture, it, it's not gonna have the same effect. So just reading even like the, the stories of the Dhammapada commentary, it gives you a, a feel for what it was like living in ancient India. It gets you closer to the historical Buddha, sort of like I was saying earlier, reading um, Miracle of Love, stories about Neem Karoli Baba, it gives you a feel of like being in his presence. You know, it gives you the feel of being in the presence of a, of a sage. And so just picking up on just the whole ancient Indian, just the whole world view, and then how Dhamma fits into that, it kind of gives you a, more of a big picture, more of a comprehensive picture that can help you to absorb Dhamma better, so to speak. So, yeah, I mean, some of the, the fire-breathing dragons and talking animal stories and so forth are, are interesting, and you can, you can still learn something from them, even though it, it's not very likely that... The, the historical Guda, Gautama Buddha himself was teaching it. So I hope I answered that question. It was, I already answered one similar to that above. And so it's almost like answering the same question. So I'm just going to move on to uh, the Proto Pseudo Monk's next question here, which is, is the left hand path, for example, Tantra, music, Nada Yoga, sex, even possible? for achieving enlightenment, or are the only contributing factors for Nibbana radical renunciation the right-hand path? I don't understand how, despite Nibbana not having a cause, there are certain causes and conditions which help to see Nibbana, because if monkhood isn't a direct cause for Nibbana, I might as well stay as a layperson where other causes and conditions may help see Nibbana. For example, stress at work, becoming tired, disenchanted of desires, the difficulties that may not appear in a cave. In a cave, there may not be enough friction to cause a realization into the ultimate. I'm curious to hear your thoughts given your direct experience and the term you coined samsara on a higher difficulty setting. And it just turns out that this is the very last question too. It always catches me by surprise. So, I mean, mainly he's asking, is the left-hand path um, even possible for achieving enlightenment? And yeah, I mean, anything is possible. It is possible. And it, for some people, it probably works best. But it doesn't work for everybody. And there are dangers involved in like a tantric kind of approach to Dhamma. That, I mean, if you are capable of living a saintly life, then that is going to cause more calmness, more clarity, 
more opportunities for this sort of um, equanimity and expanded consciousness to arise, clarity of mind, which can then help you to see through the illusion. Like fourth jhana, I've, I've mentioned this a number of times, that fourth jhana is, is like stilling your mind until you've got a flat calm, so to speak. And then you're not as distracted by the waves because there aren't any waves in your mind. You know, it's, it's like you're, you, you're, you don't have anything to distract you from seeing the truth. There's still no guarantee that you're going to suddenly get liberating insight from having attained fourth jhana. But uh, it does increase the odds that whatever happens, I mean, you're, there's going to be like the shift from no longer identifying with the samsaric me and you, you just sort of transcend that. And the, the transcendent state is already there, which is, it's, it's like a, a, a paradox. And Mahayana Buddhism really plays up that paradox. They make it even seem even more paradoxical. They emphasize the paradox of it, whereas Theravada tries to like hammer out some way for it not to be a paradox, but they don't do a very good job of it. So, I mean, if you can be completely mindful doing anything, then, I mean, that is a spiritual practice. If you can have sex mindfully, that could be a spiritual practice. Um... And for some people, they, I mean, some people maybe just can't stop having sex. It's, they can be celibate, but they're just going to be frustrated and horny the whole time that they're celibate. So they might try something else, you know, try and use sex as a vehicle for you know, mindfulness practice and so forth. And I do think it's possible. I think the orthodox position of Theravada is no, it doesn't work. That That's just foolishness. You're just you know, falling into the, the snares of Mara by doing such things. But I do think it is possible that you can become enlightened not being a monk. But it's like, if I, I've, I've, I've brought this up before, I've considered this before, like, let's say that by being a monk, you're 1000 times more likely to become enlightened. But there are, you know, a million times more people in this world than there are monks who are really, you know, trying to live the monk's life, you know, really trying to become enlightened. So still, there's going to be a thousand times more unenlightened, more lay people enlightened than monks, even though the odds of becoming a monk are a thousand times higher. If the, if the proportion of lay people to monks is a million to one, then still there's going to be a thousand times more enlightened lay people than enlightened monks. Just going with the math, assuming that I didn't mess up the math in that story problem. So, yeah, technically, Nibbana doesn't have a cause, but I've explained this before, like, like Krishnamurti is saying, it's like opening the window. I mean, the, the breeze isn't going to blow in if the window is closed, but even if you open it, there's still no guarantee that the breeze is going to blow in. It's just something that is, is a paradox that the mind cannot grasp happens presumably and then enlightenment is achieved although i mean it's it's the enlightened state has always been there all along so the enlightenment doesn't really start in a paradoxical way it's always been there it's just that you've been so distracted by all the noise and commotion in your head that you haven't noticed it and some people are just addicted to being unenlightened and it's going to take really some doing. I mean, pretty much everybody is addicted to some degree uh, to being unenlightened. So, you got two words stuck together here. Let's see here. So, did I answer this question? That is my question to myself. Is the left-hand path even possible for achieving enlightenment? Yeah, it is possible but it's more dangerous and the odds are lower. But for some people, just being a saint isn't an option. You know, just renouncing the world and wandering homeless and all that in just radical renunciation, it's, it's really, it doesn't work for them either. So, yeah, radical renunciation isn't, exactly necessary, although it is certainly helpful. What the Buddha was doing 
was he was not coming up with the only way of possibly becoming enlightened. He was just maximizing your odds of becoming enlightened. You know, this method works for just, you know, increasing, you know, maximizing your chances of becoming enlightened, especially in ancient India. Because it it's, doesn't really fit the system nearly as well in the modern West. So I'm going to add an apostrophe here. He had, didn't put an apostrophe in his contraction. So I hope I answered that question. Gosh. Yeah, I mean, what he, what he says down here is like, I might as see if monkhood isn't a direct cause for nirvana, I might as well stay as a lay person where other causes and conditions may help see nibbana, stress at work, becoming tired and disenchanted of desires. Yeah, but if, if you're just so distracted by work that you're not even thinking about anything higher, you know, you get so caught up in samsara that you're just lost in it. That's not going to work either. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some kind of catastrophe to slam you out of your unenlightened state in that case, which I have read does happen sometimes that you got just a person who's just living a worldly life. You know, they obviously had some kind of potential, but then they just have a near death experience or, or something really horrible happens and it just slams them into a, into a higher state of consciousness, which is why I think most people who become enlightened in the West, assuming that becoming enlightened even means anything. Most people who have some kind of, you know, awakening experience. They have it accidentally. So, I mean, if you don't want to have it accidentally, you want to have it on purpose, then you're better off doing some kind of serious striving along yogic lines. But I assume there are people who have become enlightened through practicing Tantra. I just can't think of any offhand. Maybe Paul Lowe would, would be a possibility. So, in a cave, there may not be enough friction to cause a realization into the ultimate. Um, yeah, well, I mean, caves can be kind of challenging anyway. But, I mean, if you're living in some comfortable, carpeted, air-conditioned monastery, uh, yeah, you may be uh, not dealing with any of any real issues. You know, it's, you're just kind of living like a, a house cat or something. Then, yeah, that, that would be understandable. But just uh, throwing yourself upon the mercy of the universe and wandering homeless and penniless... Yeah, that's definitely challenging. And uh, it pretty much forces you to sink or swim. So that's a kind of good situation to put yourself into is one that forces you to sink or swim. But then again, some people will sink. There is a certain amount of risk involved. So I'm not sure if I even answered that question. I think I did. But uh, that was it. That's the last question. So if you have any questions about Buddhism, about Dhamma, meditation, monasticism, Buddhist texts, me personally, philosophy in general, that kind of thing. Feel free to ask in the comments below. If you have access to Subscribestar, you can ask them there. If you have access to the Discord server, more or less associated with me and my output, you can ask them there. And like the video if you liked it. And... Uh, be happy and I'm going to push the stop record button now.